Okay, I think we will get started now. Thanks for your patience. We were just waiting for the audience um, online to enter the room. Um, welcome um, to the Wiener Holocaust Library. Welcome back to the library um, this evening. Um, we are delighted to have you here uh, for tonight's event, our hybrid panel on letter writing and Holocaust studies, which is the public event for our international workshop that we hosted today of the same title. The Wiener Holocaust Library, um, in partnership with the Holocaust Research Institute at Royal Holloway University of London for the Holocaust um, and Genocide Research Partnership, and in partnership with the Parks Institute for the study of Jewish non-Jewish relations at the University of Southampton, are delighted to host this hybrid panel discussion with Professor Shirley Gilbert and Professor Joachim Schler, led in conversation by Charlie Knight on letters in Holocaust-related research. Both Gilbert and Schler have conducted extensive research on treasure troves of personal correspondence belonging to Jewish refugees. They will reflect on their significance for our understanding of everyday experiences of persecution and forced migration during the Holocaust. So before I introduce our chair, I have the fun duty of giving you just the usual housekeeping spiel. So if you hear the fire alarm go off, um, there's only one entry and one exit into the building, just exit uh, the entrance in which you came and gather across the street. Um, hopefully that won't happen. Um, and if you need to use the toilets, they're um, accessible from the lift in the back of the building. You just exit this door and go to go to the back and take uh, the lift to the basement. Um, we are having an online audience tonight, so welcome um, you as well. And if you have a question or a comment during the event, you can put that in the chat and we will try to get to as many questions after the formal remarks um, as possible, either from the online audience or um, here in the room. And I just ask if you are asking a question here in the room, just to wait for a microphone because otherwise people at home can't hear you. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our chair for tonight's event. Charlie Knight is a postgraduate researcher at the Parks Institute for the Study of Jewish Non-Jewish Relations at the University of Southampton. He is the recipient of the Wolfson Postgraduate Scholarship in the Humanities for his research on German Jewish refugees in Britain during the 1930s and 1940s. His most recent article with Jewish Culture and History looks at narrative construction in the letter collection of Theodor Hirschberg. He is also co-organizer of today's workshop, Letter Writing and Holocaust Studies. So welcome, Charlie. Uh, thank you very much, Christine, for the introduction to the talk as a whole. But as Christine said, this is the public event for the workshop that we were able to host earlier to, to a day with speakers from various countries, from various backgrounds, um, which was a great day to kind of um, highlight the work that's being done on, on uh, letter writing in the uh, 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 Holocaust studies more broadly. Um, the plan for the, the event this evening, we'll hear from both speakers uh, speakers for about 20 or so minutes each. Um, uh, they'll then have a chance to respond to each other's uh, papers, and then we'll open the uh, uh, questions to both here in the room and uh, online. So I guess we'll introduce our speakers and then we can get going with their talks. Mm -hmm. Shirley Gibbert is a professor of modern Jewish history at at University College uh, London and a specialist in modern Jewish history with particular interest in the Holocaust and its legacies, uh, modern Jewish identity and Jews in South Africa. She is the author of uh, From Things Lost, among numerous other books and essays. And uh, before coming to uh, UCL, she was the Carton Professor of uh, uh, Modern History and the previous uh, director of the uh, Parks Institute um, at the uh, uh, University of uh, Southampton, where I am now, and where uh, Jochen is right now. So, <laughs> our um, our uh, second speaker will be uh, Jochen Schler, um, who is professor of uh, modern Jewish and non-Jewish relations at 
the uh, University of uh, Southampton. He's the author of uh, Escaping Nazi Germany, One Woman's uh, Immigration from uh, Halberon to uh, England, and is the editor of the journal Jewish Culture and History and the co-editor of the online journal Mobile Culture Studies. So I'll now give the uh, chair over to uh, Shirley, who will do our first talk. Thank you very much. Thanks, Charlie, for that introduction, uh, for the invitation to, to speak. It's really lovely to be here, and it's been great to attend today's conference and hear some of the really stimulating research that is happening. Um, it's also a real treat to be able to share the panel with my um, respected former Parks colleague, uh, Joachim Schler. Um, and it's interesting to think that just eight or nine years ago, when both you and I were working on our books, there was hardly any scholarship on Holocaust letters. And I think work has developed, as is evident from the conference today, work has developed um, a fair amount since then and continues to grow. And I think that's not coincidental because it's also over the past decade or two that increasing numbers of private collections have started to worm their way out of the attics and drawers, um, or in Daniel's case, the, um, the sofas um, in a more unusual case. But these private collections are emerging um, as the victims of Nazism start to reach the end of their lives. And as the collections have begun to emerge, um, so too have questions about their potential historical significance um, and how we might most fruitfully approach them, both in practical terms and also in analytical terms. And it's clear to me from today's discussion that um, while we're kind of um, working at the edges of that, we still have a long way to go to think about um, these letters as sources and how we use them. So the, the collection on which I based my book from Things Lost was that of Rudolf Schwab, who left Nazi Germany in 1933 um, and arrived in Cape Town in 1936. Um, it's a pretty large collection made up of about 4,000 written pages, mostly letters and some documents and, and various ephemera, as well as several dozen photographs. And the, the collection as a whole dates from the early 1930s to the early 1970s. And it was all carefully preserved by Rudolf in a wooden trunk, um, which was discovered almost four decades later in 2009 in a garage in Johannesburg by his granddaughter. Um, and Rudolf, as other letter writers um, did, not only kept copies of the letters that he received, but also carbon copies of his own responses. And what, so what we have is a largely complete correspondence, going back to that um, word completeness, of course, it's incomplete in lots of ways, but a correspondence that spans um, almost four decades and five continents. So what I want to do in my talk today, and I've kept my remarks um, quite short um, to about 20 minutes. So really just to raise so, some overarching questions um, that arose during my work with Rudolf's correspondence. Um, and I wanna stress, um, although I think it's obvious that I'm not offering any kind of comprehensive strategy for analyzing letters. And I think that kind of thing is really impossible with sources that are so individual and idiosyncratic as, as these kinds of sources are. Um, but rather I'm seeing this conversation and this forum as an opportunity to ask questions and think more deeply about approaches that inform the work of so many of us um, sitting here today um, and to acknowledge also the audience that is at home. Um, potentially there are researchers among them too who are grappling with these issues. So um, the overarching question that I want to start with is the extent to which letters and the often very large sprawling collections in which we find them, how those sources differ from other ego documents with which Holocaust historians already work. So things like testimonies, diaries, memoirs. Um, and I suppose it's worth saying explicitly, um, also for people who weren't here earlier today, that we're talking about letters, but often letters don't come by themselves. They come in large packages that include photographs and include receipts and bills and diaries and, and all sorts of other things. So we're not thinking about the, the sources in isolation. Um, how are they different from those other ego documents? Um, victims accounts already play a prominent role in the writing of Holocaust history and scholars have already thought quite deeply about 
how, when, and where uh, testimonies and diaries especially fit into historiographical work. So where do the letters fit in? Are they just another addition to this already vast archive? What new perspectives can they offer us? To what extent do they enrich what we already know or complicate it or disrupt our prevailing understandings? Um, there's by now a fairly well-developed scholarly literature on letters in general and their potential as historical sources. And we heard a little about that, especially in Hannah's paper earlier this morning. Um, it's a discussion that's happened particularly in the area of migration studies. Um, a scholars have noted that while letters pose all sorts of analytical challenges, they also offer distinctive insight into elements of the migration process that are perhaps not as easily accessed by other means. In particular, letters are seen as a rich space through which individuals make sense of their shifting circumstances across time and in dialogue with others. Um, I won't say more about that literature here for reasons of time, um, but I've written about it elsewhere as have others. Um, what, I, what I do want to do is introduce some examples from the Schwab family's correspondence in order to start teasing out some of the questions that I posed. Uh, and I wanna emphasize again that my choice of examples is not in itself especially significant. What I'm really taking is, as my key job today, as it were, is to think through how personal correspondences like this can be used as source material for thinking about the Holocaust and also beyond. I'm conscious of the title of our um, seminar being Letter Writing and Holocaust Studies, um, but what's so striking about um, many of these collections is that they don't just start and stop at the Holocaust. Um, and, and so they, they open something broader up for us as well. So I wanna talk about just two broad areas of Rudolf's correspondence in order to raise some distinct issues in each case. Uh, the first uh, area I want to talk about is letters between Rudolf and his parents from the Nazi period itself. So when he was in South Africa, well, on his way, and then in South Africa, and his parents were uh, back in Germany, in Hanau. Um, and second, Rudolf's correspondence with surviving family members from the late 1940s and then the subsequent decades. So let me start with Nazi-era correspondence, and perhaps an obvious first point to make, and certainly it's been made through the day to day, but also an important point, is the value of these letters as contemporary sources. Um, there is very little that is new in these letters, at least in, in Rudolf's family's letters, um, from the perspective of facts. Uh, there's not much to learn there about Nazi policy or the obstacles to immigration and so on, but the letters offer a perspective that is very different from post-war testimonies, which are by definition describing the events in hindsight um, by those who survived when the outcome of the events is known. Whereas letters convey the uncertainties of life as it was lived at the time when the future was unclear. Now, there are of course many other sources that offer contemporary glimpses into the lived experiences of Nazism's victims. We have diaries, of course, we have chronicles, we have songs, um, the subject of my earlier research. But among these sources, letters are also distinctive as acts of exchange that unfold in dialogue with one another and often across extended periods of time. And so in their nature, they offer a kind of insight into experiences as they are negotiated over long periods of reflection and discussion. In the case of the family's correspondence, the conversations that unfold reveal less about the political context, the, the kind of immediate political context, than some of its less immediately observable effects. For example, the dynamics that lie behind the eventual decision to emigrate, the slow and painful fracturing of Jews' relationship to Germany, the pressure on family uh, and especially marital relationships, uh, the construction of new identities in exile and, and various other themes. Um, and I, I was struck today by the number of times that people talked about how the letters don't really say anything. If you look at the letters, they don't say very much. They're really mundane. And there's a kind of plea for the value of the mundane. Um, 
And I think that there's more to it than this. There's something about the unfolding of events over time, which means actually they are saying something. It's not just mundane detail, but it doesn't emerge explicitly, um, which is also why I decided not to have examples from the collection, because I think actually for these kinds of processes that evolve across time, it's very difficult for me to choose you know, two or three quotes, which will illustrate that. It's really something that comes out like when you're watching a slow indie film and after two hours, it kind of becomes clear, the picture that has unfolded. Um, over many letters in the 1930s, it emerges that Rudolph's decision to leave was spurred not only, or perhaps not even primarily by external events, but perhaps more so by a difficult relationship with his father who was a staunchly patriotic war veteran and an observant Jew. If we look at Max Schwab's letters to his son in Johannesburg, we see his frustration growing at how his authority is weakening. And he expresses his outrage that by leaving, Rudolf is throwing away his family's esteemed history in Germany and replacing it with nothing. On the other hand, he also tries to reach across the divide between them. And, and most of Max's letters to Rudolf over the course of the 1930s expressed this very fragile mix of advice and anger and longing and accusations mixed in with words of love and reassurance for a son that he also obviously misses. Um, and again, as I was, I was saying earlier, in the nature of the source material itself is the fact that this insight emerges not from anything that is explicitly said, but from what emerges slowly and subtly across time. The ongoing correspondence between Max and Rudolf, father and son, across several years exposes tensions that had clearly developed long before the external crisis, but were nonetheless intensified because of it. Things like uh, Rudolf's minimal communication with his parents, his reluctance to accept their advice, his gradual drift away from Jewish observance. The letters also expose the growing strain on Rudolf's parents' relationship. So during the November pogroms of 1938, the Schwab home was plundered, and it seems likely that the 50-year-old Marta, his mother, was sexually assaulted. Um, and Max, his father, was arrested and deported to Buchenwald. Um, now, Martha had long been pursuing options for immigration without Max's approval, or without Max's knowledge. And she must, in the wake of the pogroms, have eventually secured immigration papers because Max was released a few weeks later. But even after his release, he was not willing to consider immigration and they stayed. And despite another violent attack in September, 1939, when a witness again strongly implied that Marta was raped, Max still refused to even think about immigration. And the dialogues that unfolded in the family's correspondence during the second half of the 1930s particularly as mother and father play off their own quarrels against their child, um, make visible the gradual process of the marriage's breakdown, even though it is at no point explicitly spoken about. So I've used these brief points about the family's Nazi era correspondence to suggest that through letters, we can access individual and interpersonal dynamics that are much less likely to surface in non-dialogical sources. By tracing sustained conversation between the relatives, we see incremental shifts in their attitudes and in the relationships between them. Um, and it's worth saying again that letters don't um, stand on their own necessarily as historical sources. It's often very helpful uh, to recruit additional materials, to contextualize them, to make sense of them. Um, and also to, to think alongside them, you know, what, what, is, what is narrated in a letter compared with a photograph or, or a later interview. We're taken alongside these materials, letters can offer the historian an insight into deep seated drives, desires, dynamics that might otherwise remain opaque. So, so that's the very brief section on Nazi era correspondence. Um, and I'm now going to, to move equally briefly to talk a bit about post-Holocaust correspondence, although I'll preface that with some thoughts about um, historical value and periodization. Uh, so um, 
this is where I raised the issue that I mentioned earlier about where do these letters fit into Holocaust studies. Um, in the case of Rudolf Schwab, and I, I suspect many German Jews like him, certainly some of those we've heard about today, the letters transform them from someone unexceptional in historical terms to someone is, who is historically significant, not because of anything they did or said, but simply because of the catastrophic events through which they lived for a time. Rudolf almost certainly did not see the Holocaust as the defining feature of his life. For more than three decades after his arrival in South Africa, he spent his time negotiating the struggles of an immigrant, South African politics, in which he was engaged for a little while, um, and the challenges of starting and running his own business. His experience of Nazism certainly determined where his letters ended up, um, which is in Yad Vashem, and framed my own initial engagement with those letters, but it's actually only one part certainly an important part, but only one part of his much larger historical trajectory. Many letter collections similarly characterized as Holocaust related, begin before the Nazi period, sometimes decades, sometimes even centuries before, and continue for many years after. Uh, we refer to them as archives or collections for want of better terms, but these words impose a structure and a unity that many of these compilations of materials don't necessarily possess. Letters are written one at a time by multiple correspondents over long periods of time, and the letter writer may never see the whole or even part of what is eventually archived. Rudolf's correspondence certainly does not fit into the neat category of Holocaust related, either in chronological or in geographic or in thematic terms. The letters span the five continents across which the surviving fat family was scattered and almost four decades between Rudolf's departure for South Africa in 1933 and his death in 1971. While it's of course possible to zoom in on the Nazi related segments, um, to do so is to miss crucial links and continuities between events in Nazi Europe and larger dynamics and processes. The Schwab letters mirror the dispersal of European Jewry by the Nazi catastrophe. We have Rudolf in South Africa, his uncle Alex in Shanghai, and then later in St. Paul, Minnesota, um, a cousin in France or an aunt in France, a cousin in Britain and then in Canada, another cousin in Sao Paulo, um, and many correspondences of Jewish families from this period are similarly scattered. Uh, they're also similarly predictable in content, describing the humdrum of daily life, what they're doing, how they're adapting to new circumstances, jobs, languages, etc. What the ca family correspondence does allow us to observe over the course of almost three decades is the ongoing process of family members recalibrating their lives and relationships and identities not only in these far-flung new places where they've ended up, but also in the shared conversations between them. And there's a lot of resonance here with things we've spoken about today. The letters themselves is a, a space that inhabits that uh, transnational connection or even embodies that transnational connection. I'm going to focus on just one area of the post-war correspondence for reasons of time, and that is the family's decades-long battle around restitution and reparations, which also is a feature in so many uh, family collections. The conversations between the relatives are full of boring details of compensation claims, debates about whether and where to claim the value of this mahogany sideboard or the Persian rug or grandma's Shabbos candlesticks. And when I started working on the collection, I I subconsciously imagined that these claims documents would not really be relevant to my research. They constitute about half of those 4,000 pages in the trunk. And I thought, oh, well, okay, you know, hopefully there'll be lots of rich material in the other 2,000 pages. But as I read them, it became clear, of course, that they were not only legal claims, but also a medium for memory work, for the relatives to begin expressing what they had lost and to begin mourning it. None of the relatives believed that anything would come out of these claims. But nonetheless, they continued to pursue them for years with exceptional energy. 
And over the course of those years and decades, it becomes clear, again, through the slow and incremental process in the letters, um, that the process of compiling, of, of planning, conceptualizing, compiling and submitting the claims was a forum for them to vent their rage at Germany for what it had done and for its continued refusal to recognize their suffering. The claims were also about their identity as German Jews. They became a vehicle for remembrance, for talking about how their family had contributed to communal life, for reflecting on their own feelings and the refugees' own feelings about Germany and their identities as Jews, remembering the relationships that they had nurtured, the homes in which they had lived. For example, um, in a compensation claim which he submitted in June 1960, Rudolf included um, a, a very poignantly a 1933 letter from the local rabbinate um, describing his parents as highly respected, the fact that the Schwab family had already lived in Hanau for the past three centuries, had always played an important role in the community, and we find these kinds of things peppered through all of the compensation claims. Now, such evidence was not really going to influence a compensation panel's deliberations, but that is really beside the point. In the debates among the family members about how to represent their claims, and also in the submissions themselves, the victims mourned what they had lost, and at the same time started to construct a basis from which they could rebuild their identities. Um, and what we see in these correspondences, again, is a process that emerges subtly across time. The letters offer insight not only into the victims' experiences during the Holocaust or the kind of compensation they, they sought, but also their continuing efforts to absorb that past into the new identities that they were trying to fashion them for themselves in Johannesburg, in Shanghai, in Sao Paulo, and beyond. The Schwab family's correspondence sheds light on lots of additional themes to those that I've considered tonight, um, often similarly informed by the Holocaust, but also directing our gaze far beyond the Holocaust. And I won't go into them for reasons of time. Um, I just want to end with a, a couple of brief thoughts, um, and, and hopefully we can have the larger conversation together. I'm imagining or hoping that this is not just a Q&A, but really that the kinds of questions that have been percolating up through the day can, can be part of a larger conversation. By their nature, large correspondences like this one are difficult to categorize. Their significance can't be confined simply to studies of the Holocaust or of German Jews or of South African Jews or of the refugee diaspora or of anything else. They are stubbornly individual and idiosyncratic. And at the same time, they potentially have much wider historical importance. And I think we talked today about microhistory, or kind of a few times the word microhistory came up. And I think what's happening with letters is different. This is not merely microhistory. And I think this is one of the things, too, that I hope we can talk about. Um, what, what is the, the relationship between the individual and the idiosyncratic and, and that broader um, import? As with other historical materials, I think they're most fruitfully used in parallel alongside other sources. And it's interesting to think about what they reveal and what they obscure when we place them alongside other sources. And one of the things that particularly strikes me is um, the, the happy immigration photographs chronicling um, German Jews leaving Germany in comparison with the letters that reflect <clears throat> um, a sometimes subtly, sometimes not so subtly different narrative. As more collections of personal correspondence continue to be discovered, I hope we'll continue to have these conversations about the purposes for which we archive these collections, the interpretive approaches we can use to draw out their insights, and the many productive challenges that I think they can pose to our accepted historical understandings. Thanks. Right. Good evening. This is a one-hour lecture for next week. <laughs> but I thought maybe it looks better when I have a bit of paper with me. Um, thank you very much for having me. Thank you very much, um, Charlie and everybody 
uh, for organizing this really wonderful workshop that I really enjoyed and as really said great to be with you uh, day long on a topic that really has kept us busy for uh, for quite a while um, three things that I would like to talk about one is my history with letters so when did I first come across uh, such collections about 30 years ago in early 1990s Secondly, shortly present, uh, here she is already, and her daughter is also here, uh, Liesl Rosenthal around 1932, tell the story of the work uh, that I could do on the story of the emigration of this young lady from her and my hometown of Heilbronn in southwest Germany, and in a way how I became a Heilbronner again, uh, in a way, here's a Schwab, there's a Schwab, ich bin ein Schwabe, but... but. What can happen? So when I was at the University of Tel Aviv in 1991, um, I was invited by a couple of people in, in, in this area. For those who know Tel Aviv, Ben Yehuda, Rechov Ben Yehuda Straße, as they said, uh, Frischmann, Mapu, where you could still hear a little bit of German on the street or Hebrew with the German and Austrian accent, where you could go to Landsberger's bookshop and, and to a couple of cafes where people try to evoke the past reading newspapers and having this gesprochene Zeitung where they translated the Hebrew newspapers for those who couldn't read the Hebrew. Um, and, and, and I started visiting people and, and saw these wonderful apartments, uh, Alien Marianne Rothschild, Viola and Mordechai Leschupski, Ernst Glaske, Eva Sänger, Nadja Tausig and, and many others and of course they not only had things that they had brought from Germany, the, the earlier they could leave Germany, the more they were able to bring of their furniture and books and, and paintings on the walls. Uh, but in the meantime, of course, because they had settled and had somehow found their way into Israeli society mixed with things Israeli, Israeli art on, on the walls and Hebrew books, uh, on the shelves and I stayed on Mapu Street 4 and on the other side of the street on the same floor Mapu 3 lived Nadja Tausig who together with her husband Ernst Tausig had kept a kind of literary salon for 50 years between 1941 and 1991 and um, she gave me a list of Vorträge gehalten im Hause Tausig uh, this house Taus, it used to be a wonderful house in Prague, now it was a flat on Mapu uh, 3 in, in Tel Aviv, but still a list of all the important names of German Jewish intellectuals, uh, Sami Gronemann, Max Brod, Shalom Ben-Korin, Margot Klausner, Helmar Lersky, Leo Perutz, Arnold Zweig, and a couple of others who gave lectures in that flat between 41 and 91 in German, but already discussing uh, the emerging Arab-Israeli conflict, the geographical position of Palestine, the plans of Palestine, and Mr. Tausig every few weeks could present his Briefmarkensammlung. Um, so a, a, a German speaking, a German Jewish club, um, and I had this list and went out and made a copy and brought the list back. And when I came back, I thought there must be more. So I asked Frau Tausig, all these people, Klaus Nordzweig, they must have written letters to you. Yeah. yeah, what can I do? Um, I offered to copy them and order them in archive boxes, whatever, for the price of a copy. And, and she said, okay, you can do that, but only after I have moved to the Elternheim. And then she moved to the Elternheim and a week later she died. And somebody from her relatives came and just threw everything out of that flat in the Elternheim, including the letters. This must have happened very often here because of the circumstances that children were not qualified enough to be interested. They had other things to do, become Israelis, learn Hebrew, be good citizens of that new state, forget about the past, forget about the diaspora of this world, elements and signs, and, and you can't read them anyway. And it's in, in, in one of these two letters. Sudolin or, or other German 
traditional handwriting and 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 so they were thrown away and the last example for for that first part i saw walter grab walter grab was a um, very interesting personality who moved to tel aviv from vienna in 1919 and made money selling handbags on the street after decades he became a professor he became the director of the Institute for German History at the, at the University of Tel Aviv. And he lived on Gordon Street. Um, and I asked him what Heimat meant for him. And he said, well, it can't be Vienna, really, because of that anti-Semitism. It can't be Jerusalem because of that religion. It must be this balcony with a view of the Mediterranean, a way to get out, uh, but also in the city, surrounded by manuscripts and books. He, he wrote a lot about liberation movements in German history from the peasants wars through 1848 to the small anti-Nazi resistance uh, that we had. And I thought, what will happen to his papers? <sighs> they have been saved. In that case, uh, a fantastic development, I think, has taken place that I could be part of in a, in a certain way from, say, the late 1990s on when I came back from, from Tel Aviv and started work in Potsdam. One of the initiatives was to um, set up a conference on Jewish archives as part of the European cultural heritage to foster collaboration between Jewish archives and state archives that held Jewish related, say, uh, historical archives. Ben Gar Barco was there in Potsdam. Um, Karen Robson from Southampton was there, and so many other people. Um, we had a conference in, in Cape Town on Jewish migration and the archives, which I think is an important, has been an important step to bring these two research areas um, together. And then in Jerusalem, they developed a fantastic project sponsored by the, the German Foreign Office uh, for the creation of a more virtual archive. So it's, it's, it's not so important to, to, to save documents and bring them to an archive, but they make them accessible in whatever way, some in print, some, some online, of exactly those German Jewish intellectuals, or at least the rest of them, uh, where the archival material uh, could have been kept. So something has indeed happened since these early 1990s. There has been more and more interest in letters as such very widely, not just family letters, but letters like the ones I, I talked about. Um, a more specific way to deal with these collections, to approach them from different angles. And I think obviously to bring migration research together with research on, on letters made a lot of sense like we do today in this conference calling it holocaust studies but really holocaust studies in a very wide sense before the holocaust post holocaust uh, stories as well so i had a kind of sensitivity already kind of feeling it's fantastic to have such material in your hands just the, the haptic uh, of it is, is really amazing and then one day was it 2012 also, uh, Julia Neuberger, Baroness Rabbi Julia Neuberger, gave a talk at the University of Southampton uh, and mentioned how her uh, own mother, on the last day of her life, had forgotten, forgotten her acquired English and, and spoke Schwäbisch, uh, saying, I will heim. This is what still in my, in my mind. When, when you said, uh, but mommy, you are home, she said, no, no, Heilbronn because that was the city where she was born. And I am sure if you had said Stuttgart in that moment, I would have just said, oh, how interesting. Nice to meet you, Lady Neuberger, um, goodbye. But because you said Heilbronn, I thought, oh my God, that's the place where I come from. Um, I have a relationship to, to, to that place. and It is contingency, and there's a lot of contingency, I think, around in this in this kind of research. So, so I said, wow, this is interesting for me. I was born in Heilbronn. You said, I've got letters. Uh, and then we met one day here in London and I, I still see you opening the box, or boxes, and then opening those bundles, nicely bundled up of letters and realizing 
what can I do with it? It's difficult to read. It's some, but, but you must have seen how moved I was <laughs> starting to read um, these letters um, about my hometown, which doesn't look exactly like that anymore. It has um, been bombed down by the Royal Air Force in 1944, but that's an old street, Götzenturmstraße 43, where the Rosenthal and Donacher wine cellars have been. So we talk about a family of wine merchants. My own family were wine farmers uh, in a village in the region, though, so that there was a kind of connection um, that I found fascinating. This is a beautiful factory by Rosenthal um, and, and Donacher that tells us a bit of the iconography of the city the place where the wine came from, the, the way they were buying wine in large quantities and then selling them to hotels and restaurants and, and other places. So an important, I'm thinking of, of, of Stephanie Fischer's work on fee handler, wine handler, obviously are very much an, an important part of that. Also that it is rural uh, Jewish, German, German Jewish communities um, that the Rosenthal family stands for. This is not only a very nice mixture of modernist architecture on the left and a kind of orientalist um, architecture of the synagogue in Heilbronn, Heilbronn standing next to each other, but it's also a postcard that Liesl's mother Hermine sent to her daughter in London in September 1937. Liesl was born in 1915. As a 22-year-old, she worked in a bookshop in Frankfurt and decided more or less on her own to leave because of persecution, the political situation. Uh, she came to Birmingham first as a domestic servant, then moved on to London, worked for Marx and Spencer. Um, in a time when her parents and her little brother were still back in Heilbronn, and of course her emigration to Birmingham first and then to London is the starting point of the correspondence. Um, this obviously intensifies uh, with the political development that we all know. That's the synagogue we have just seen burning on the morning of the 10th of November, 1938. The correspondence that Julia just handed over to me and in two plastic bags, I took it to the underground to Waterloo and then to Southampton and then one day to Berlin and then I sat down and ordered it chronologically and I thought I want, I want to try to write the story from the letters, taking the letters as my starting point and write the story as good as possible, adding material where possible through archival work, through meeting people, talking to them and through walking to my hometown of Heilbronn and trying to meet people who had any idea of this history, nothing, um, obviously. But now for this context, I got more and more fascinated by the letters. This is one written by an uncle in Switzerland. It's like a cliche in many of these collections. Often there is an uncle in Switzerland um, who has a little bit of money and has the opportunity to send letters uh, from neutral Switzerland. So that's a very important point. And then one of my really favorite um, documents is this postcard written to the larger uh, extent by Liesl's mother Hermine and only the um, pencil written parts on the left and upper side are written by the father. You see uh, the stamp Heilbronn and Necker. It's already March 1939. Liesl lives in the meantime on Furlough Road um, in London and help is becoming more and more urgent for those who still have not been able to decide where they want to go. The family discusses Australia and Chile. Why Australia and Chile? Because of the wine, of course. An emigrant thinks uh, they don't, don't just run away. They, they make plans, obviously. Can I use my knowledge of wine when I go to Australia? They think of Uruguay. Why Uruguay? I don't really know. Uruguay keeps coming up in the correspondence. Um, in the end, it will be their daughter who manages to bring the parents and the little brother over. There is a long story of family conflict, quarrel, um, atmosphere 
say well, I thought to such an extent that for lethal um, emigration functions as emancipation in a, in a certain way. She grows up in this process. She has a fantastic love affair with, with the guy in Bombay who intends to marry her and she travels there and, and looks at him and goes back and doesn't marry him. <laughs> her parents are mad, of course, but not just mad with their daughter, but also mad with sorrow. Because what, what a rich man in Bombay, that could have been the solution. Yeah, so we, we keep mixing the, the, the big history in a way and this, this little often mundane, but often also very exciting uh, family history um, all the time. And it's documented in these, in these letters. And of course, to, to add to the questions that, that, that Shirley has put, what is my role in this? Who, I mean, Julia allowed me to look at these letters, but speaking as a, as a cultural historian say, is it of any, matter to me that a young girl from Heilbronn has an affair with a guy in Bombay? Okay. Does it make sense for me to look into this? In what ways does it make sense? Can we write a history of Jewish life under Nazi persecution without such intimate knowledge, family relations, love affairs? This is the fabric of life, not, not just you know, train tickets and at least this is how I justified my constant emotional involvement in this. I, 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 I loved Liesl, you know, I identified with her. I hated her mother who kept sending these unfriendly postcards across the channel. Is, is this still okay to identify so much with your topic? I gave it to you to read, I gave it to a couple of people, and one of them said there's a little too much your argument there. So I took some, um, some of it out. Um, uh, then the Schwabs come finally in. Anna Schwab um, worked here just around the corner in Woburn House uh, with the German Jewish Aid Committee and, and Liesl supported her um, in, in that work, in, in, in that period to finally fulfill the dream of her parents and marry. Um, a wonderful man, Anna Schwab's son, Walter. This is Helmut, who became Czech, the first family member to travel back to Germany, but in uniform. Um, that's the Schwab and Rosenthal families in London, 1945. My star in the center. Um, you have to see it to learn. <laughs> Liesl with her daughter Julia in 1955, so in a certain sense, a happy ending. In other ways, there are things mentioned, hinted at in the letter, family members who don't make it out of Germany. There is, of course, a relation to the history of persecution, a relation to the history of Holocaust and migration studies and Holocaust studies, maybe another point, cannot easily be separated from each other. They, they belong together. Um, I think. Last part, if I have a couple more minutes. Um, I was intrigued by letters. So I went back to Berlin and went to Zentrum Judaicum, which is housed in the former Neue Synagoge of 1866, the house of the Golden Cupola on Oranienburger Straße, which is partly a synagogue, but more a museum, exhibition place, cultural center, meeting place, um, information center about Jewish history in Berlin and an archive. And I talked to the archivist and said, do you have letters? <laughs> and she said, yes, we have a very interesting collection. And that was my project for the last three or four years. Back to 1991, after the wall fell and Berlin was on its way to, to, to become one out of two cities and Germany's capital. Um, responsible for the representation of Germany's dealing with its past and at the same time a very attractive tourist destination, of course, with all the clubs and the creativity and the empty spaces and all that. Um, so many people traveled to Berlin, of course, in that period, um, among them Jewish families of Berlin origin uh, who thought maybe now it's time to, to have a look at these places. Secondly, the city of Berlin planned a memorial book for the murdered Jews of Berlin. 
they went to the archives, um, they, they did all the things that you have to do in order to compile such a list of, of, of horrible statistics of deportations and, and trains and, and, and dates and, and horrible sounding places. But they also turned to former Berliners. There was a visiting program since 1969, so they had a list of addresses um, and asked them for information about their deported relatives. And most people responded by saying, yes, we can do that. But don't you think we also have a story to tell? Why do you produce a book about death only and not a book about life as well? Um, that never happened, but the correspondence grew and grew and completely overwhelmed that working group that was set up by, by the Senate in order to, to realize this memorial book. And it took a long time until they finally found the time to respond to these people. And you have the most amazing letters and other things. You have a letter directed to the city of Berlin. Liebes Berlin, wenn du wüsstest, was du meinen Eltern angetan hast, if you knew what you had done to my parents. Um, childhood memories poems written to Berlin, drawings of the house uh, where somebody spent their childhood. Um, an alphabet of memory ordered alphabetically by the working group and as you do in Germany, put them in folders and put them away in an archive. But they wanted to be read. That was my feeling that many of these people um, at Southampton, we would have a big ethics committee problem. Is it allowed? to go into this archive is allowed to mention the names, but I thought these people's names needed to be mentioned. These people wanted to tell their stories. Um, so a very different type of collection, but I thought it makes sense to put it in, in this context here as well. The book came out in German two years ago and will come out with Liverpool University Press um, hopefully soon uh, in English. And, and when we, we widen the, the, the notion and the, the definition maybe of of, of letters, I, I think there are still many, many more such collections to discover. Thank you. just respond to some of the themes that were brought out in each other's papers and then hopefully that will broaden the, the conversation out to the audience afterwards I want to go first would you like to go first Lizzie? sure um thank you first it's it's I miss being in Southampton. Your approach to history is so, so inspiring. I love hearing your talks. They're always so uh just connected to individuals and evocative. It's wonderful. Like, it's just, I love it. So thank you. Um, and uh, there's lots of kind of different threads and themes and they're kind of combining and resonating with things I've been thinking about today. So maybe I'll just throw out a few. I'm not sure there's a, a ton new that I, that I have to say. Um, but maybe to start with your, your concluding comment when you say there's many more to discover and certainly that's something that's clear to me i'm sure you also get every time you give a talk or some, all the time people saying hi i've just discovered this from my uncles sisters something you know all of these collections keep coming out and the question is what to do with them i mean we've also been talking about what is the value of them and how do we approach them and whatever but there's also the very practical question of where do we archive them and and behind that is this larger question of where do they fit? What are they? What is their historical value? And there's something, I mean, it's it, the way you describe your emotional connection with the story and how, you know, it became part of your story. I had the same, you know, emotional involvement with, with, you know, my family that I wrote about. And there's a very, I think there are also very personal reasons why we do this. Um, but I wonder how many of these how many of these will there be? How, are they all historically valuable? In some way, yes, of course. 
in another way, will they find archives to house them? I mean, when people ask me now, I don't know where to recommend they put them, you know, how many more will the Wiener Library <laughs> keep them coming to the Wiener Library, apparently, um, you know, but so I wonder, I just wonder about that. Um, not because they're not valuable, but because often because they're large and they're sprawling and what's their subject. And so there's the, the issue of archiving. Um, one thing that I did want to add that you didn't really mention here, but it's it's a strategy in your book where you said, you know, one of your questions was your emotional connection and and what to do about that emotional connection. And I thought that what you did in the book um, really cleverly, I liked all the Joachim in the book um, because you raise it as a question. It's not there as a problem that you thought about and then came up with a strategy. It is there as a question. What is my role and where do I fit in? And that's, you know, that threads through the whole book and it's very thought provoking and provocative. And I think it, it works as a question, um, not as a resolution. Um, I, I noted down here contingency. You made a point about contingency, absolutely. I think both in the, sometimes in the compilation of the collection, there's a contingency and also in our own involvement as historians. Um, my involvement was also complete. I happened to be working with some curators in Johannesburg and somebody said, we found a trunk. And, and that's, that's how it happened. I think um, th there's other people in the room whose story was similar. I, I don't know what we do with that, but I, there is, um, that as well, and seems, you know, if I'm thinking about other ego documents in Holocaust history, there's a, there is a kind of contingency here that isn't always present there. Um, anyway, just, just a thought. The materiality of letters also came up a few times today. Um, so important. Also, you know, I had that experience of these these bundles of letters in strings so beautifully, somebody kept them, somebody placed all of this importance on keeping them together in particular ways and putting them in, you know, paper and string. And they are things that were, you know, someone was saying this earlier, it's, it's sent from one person to another. On the one hand, it's virtual. On the other hand, it's not, it's a, it's a piece of material. It's a flat object. Is that how you described it, Christy? It's a flat object. Um, so also something we haven't talked a ton about today. Um, the last thing I wanted to say, and this is kind of putting Charlie on the spot, but I warned him that I was going to put him on the spot, <laughs> um, is that you know one of the things that I have been thinking about or grappling with as we look at these, you know, th these huge personal collections and lots of zoomed in stories about particular families or you know, businesses or whatever it is, um, how can we start thinking across these collections? It's related to the question of what do we do with all the archives? But since Charlie's work is involved in thinking across these collections, I wondered whether now or afterwards, maybe you could also say a little bit about your thoughts about how we start thinking across them as well. Uh, for, for the part on archives, I think there is a, a growing awareness, very obviously. When I was in, in, in Tel Aviv in the early 90s, um, I talked to people in the Central Zionist archives. They were not interested in private families' papers. They wanted to have the papers of leading Zionist figures. Central archives for the history of the Jewish people collected European communities or maybe Arab Jewish communities or Latin American, but not Israeli. Uh, of course, so it, somehow it didn't fit anywhere. And then, of course, came this wonderful initiative, or a little bit earlier, by Israel Shiloni, born Alf, nee, what was Hans Hermann Hammerstein, can't be more German, be becoming Israel Shiloni in, in Naharia, and then he spoke about a conference of the Leo Beck Institute in Jerusalem and said all these beautiful faces of all these beautiful people who represent German culture, classical music, literature, knowledge, philosophy, that they will all pass away soon. Let's, let's keep their memories. So he founded a little Yekes Museum in his own house in Naharia, which when, then was brought over to the town hall of Naharia, and finally Stef Wertheimer, an industrialist, 
took it into his industrial park plus sculpture museum um, and Ruti Ofek became the curator. And then suddenly, at least for the northern part of Israel, so all these people in Haifa, in Haria, in the Krayot, in, in Shavitzion, in all these important places, they now had a place where they could give their papers to, where people would listen to them. And then, as you maybe know, the Wertheimer family stopped their financial support, and Ruti had a hard two years, and it has been managed now finally to move the archive to the University of Haifa. Uh, there's a very engaged team, Stefan Erich, um, Daniel Mahler, um, Sinai Rosinek, who, who now are going to digitize, obviously, but they will have a little space for a museum as well. So partly in Israel, this has worked out. I would also say that today, you have to be in the library, you have special collections in Southampton, I guess, who would be interested here. So the, the danger that things will get lost because no archive is interested anymore, I think it's over. There, there is an awareness now. What happens in families is, of course, I mean, you know, now, and I also meant to bring you in at some point. One good thing is that you can hand this over to the next generation. <laughs> and then if somebody, no, not anymore, but how many do you have now? How many collections? Eight. Uh, and, and then, of course, this could be a very useful next step maybe not to write each and every single family history as a book. Not all of them are equally interesting. At some points, a story has been told, and if, if it's been told again with another person, then it's of interest for that particular family. So why not publish it in, in quotation marks in a kind of private edition? This is technically uh, possible and still looks good. Or do it online can look even better and even reach more people as a kind of family memory block. I think there are there are many possibilities today. And then the next step would indeed, would indeed be, or is already, looking for topics to research, like, say, transnational existence of such families between Johannesburg and Cape Town and Buenos Aires and, and, and New York City and the former hometown. Um, where, where it could make sense to use four, five, six collections and, and develop a story uh, uh, from that. Yeah, for the, the personal involvement, I, I just can't help it. I, I, I couldn't write differently. That's just it. Also, that, that point that you kind of make there, right, about the, the role of the research within that and in some cases, it's very uh, personal, I suppose, in your case, and also in uh, your case, uh, show you too. And it's sometimes, like, I'm not German, I'm not uh, Jewish, but do I feel something for the people? Yes, but in a different way, perhaps, to people that would be more uh, closely linked to it. But also, at numerous points today, we've kind of mentioned that letters are kind of a... Uh, dialogical right that they are meant to be between people and in many cases now we don't have the people that the letters are in the between therefore i am the person that's reading them i'm the person that's that's understanding them when it wasn't meant for me so in some ways i have to be in the story right the, the you kind of have to in some way either recognize your own part in it and also or as you said put yourself in it in some way in response to your kind of uh, on the spot uh, point about how you look at uh, these collections across them, right? Um, as uh, Joachim said, you could continuously write a um, book, article on each collection you find and retell that individual story, right? Um, the collections that I use, that, that I research, are not found by choice, they're found because they happen to, to be there, they happen to occur. And I think in some ways that provides a different value to the way in which you work across them because you're finding the links not looking for, not choosing the, the collections based on the links you want to find, right? Um, so uh, I look at the way in which the families conceptualize the letter uh, across these and that wasn't made because one family views it in a particular way and another in a particular way. But I think this idea of looking at 
similar notions across multiple large collections like this perhaps provides a different insight than the way in which scholarship is perhaps existing at the moment, right? That we have many individual histories either of uh, edited collections of letters or uh, narratives or kind of source books or uh, all these di different things that exist. Perhaps a way to, in some ways, create a different outlook for me is to look across multiple ones, not, not loads, to still kind of have this feeling of using these personal like, narratives and having enough detail about them, not just as you say, like one quote, and expecting to understand the whole story, but to, and to view it across a wider spectrum. But equally, as you, as you say, not expecting to find um, like representativeness across like five collections, because it's a, it's a kind of like false goal for you to kind of achieve. But, um, I think there is definitely value in it, and I don't think I've answered your question. I think I've hopefully put some thoughts look forward for it, um, which I suppose is a good point to move to the audience if we have any questions, and I can come up and if anyone has, we're just going to get a microphone. Thank you. Thanks so much. That was really interesting. Um, Shirley, I wanted to follow on from your question about what makes letters special sources. And I'm working on one collection. And so I kind of want to take issue with <laughs> what Charlie was saying and want to make a case for working with one collection and want to put to you, Shirley, if maybe we, we have a special type of source in such an extended collection. And you're right to say that collection imposes an order that's not there. Um, because that collection forces us to find out what questions we can ask of the material and then go and answer it. So it's like a reciprocal read, talk back to it process that actually shapes our questions as well as our answers and thus allows us to come up with a new, under or new is probably a bit too big, but a different understanding of whatever history we think we're contributing to and I'm with you about the not imposing a time frame that's too preconceived so the whole 33 to 45 if I think of the letters I'm working with is artificial because the continuities are there imposed through the lifespans so the lifespans dictate what experience falls into one life so is it that we're actually having to go to our sources for the questions and then we come back out of them and then we contextualize them and find the answers. It's so interesting. I mean, like I said, I really don't want to be sitting here as a, a kind of expert on letters because I've only looked at one collection. I really feel that we're thinking this through together. You know, the kinds of letters we're looking at also are so different. Um, I, I think what you said sounds really intriguing and also kind of resonates or kind of bounces a little of um, what Charlie was saying. It sounds a little like uh, when Charlie was talking, I was thinking about the intentionality of research that goes to particular sources with research questions, trying to understand particular things, trying to figure out what's going on here. And I, I certainly think that there is something about these collections, for want of a better term, that are for all their incompleteness and all their messiness self-contained in a way we're not going to them because we want to understand anything in particular because they're not going to necessarily probably shed light on some big historical question and so maybe we just dive into them and see what they give us um certainly i can say that i went into the schwab collection the reason i was excited about this because at that time i was working on um, South African Jews' attitudes to racism. And I was very interested in how the history of anti-Semitism impacted how South African Jews encountered anti-Black racism in South Africa. So I went into the collection and I zoomed in and I found you know, a few little letters and I thought, this is not what he's talking about. That's my interest, but actually he's telling me something different. And so I, you know, I had to spend five months reading through the whole collection and then all these things came out. Um, so I find that a very, actually a very productive frame for thinking about, for thinking about them as sources. So thank you. Uh, also interesting on that point, actually, is that 
sources like letters are often concerned with things that we're not concerned with, right? That, that, that we go in, as you say, hoping to, to, to find in-depth things about the one thing and they're not written for us, right? Um, uh, even if we think like uh, testimony, say, in uh, uh, testimony is written, uh, not written is said for the interviewer's questions, which aren't ours, in the same way that I suppose the letters are not written for us, and we have to find a way to go through those. I think there's a question from... There is a question um, from our online audience, from Kirsten. Um, she's saying, thank you for these engaging talks. How can we as scholars consider the value of letter collections in which they are more, more one-sided when we don't have the responses? Have you had these experiences in working with collections? You know, this revisits some of the things that we discussed today, but for the benefit of people who didn't weren't able to attend. When it work with the letter collections, and one really important thing is that very often we have this in, as you say, one dimensional. So in, in Lise Rosenthal's case, it was, or Alice Raab, then it was really the case that most of the letters were directed to her. And I could hear her voice in some drafts where I don't know if she had really sent the letter afterwards in some very emotional responses to the uncle in Switzerland. Um, in indirect quotations or responses by others, Liesl, don't be always so and so. Then you can more or less imagine how she has acted. But there's a lot of speculation, maybe even, or at least my imagination um, playing in. What, what what you obviously can do, what I have tried in that case, is is to try to find those um, correspondence. Uh, see if there are children still alive. It has taken me to Sydney. Um, and then I think in, in, in the end, even to Papua New Guinea, to find one such instance where, where a daughter of a correspondent was still alive and remembered the story of crossing the border from Germany into the Netherlands and how her mother packed her in three, four jackets in order to take a, a lot of possessions along and she was maybe seven eight eight years old or something like that which was very moving and a, and a wonderful addition but unfortunately the only case there was one more prominent person where i had high hopes for the new school of social research where he used to work but again it, it didn't work so that really uh, happens often of course then you don't know if how complete, we talked about completeness today and said it's not something that you want to achieve. But of course, in a letter collection, you would like to know, is this it? Or did they throw away certain letters? Um, did they, I don't know, burn them, do all kinds of things that's, that, that's possible. And it, it's their letters, not, not meant for us. Um, so these are many of the also practical problems that you come across. But again, as we said during the, the morning session, it just shows you again the fragmented character of these collections and, and of memory of the Holocaust in general that we cannot amend. We, we have to accept the fragmented character of, the, of that story and of that memory. Thank you very much. Um, well, first, I want to say, you know, I am Liesl Schwab or Liesl Rosenthal's daughter. So, um, and you saw a picture of me. Oh, how embarrassing. Um, I'm hugely grateful to Joachim for, in, in a sense, you know, telling me stuff about my mother that I couldn't read. Uh, I couldn't read those letters. I couldn't read the script. I couldn't read the language. Um, I couldn't read the letters. And I suspect if it hadn't been for that extraordinary coincidence, eventually those letters would just have been thrown away. I might have had the sense to offer them to an archive, but I might have just said, oh, there's too much stuff. But the thing I wanted to ask both of you, because you both raised it, Shelley, you raised it just now about in the compensation correspondence about you know, the value of the mahogany sideboard, et cetera, is how much of the letters, which weren't meant for our eyes at all, are about things. And, and Joachim, in, in what, you know, my grandmother's letters to my mother, it's all about things. You know, shall I bring the bicycle? What on earth for? But anyway, all of that. Um, and I just wonder whether there's a kind of 
linking thing about things, because I'm very struck that my mother kept huge amounts of stuff that belonged to my grandparents, and particularly their totally hideous dinner service. Um, and I don't want it either, but I can't bring myself to throw it out either. So what is that about? And is there something in those letters about things and how you, you feel about things that is a theme that ought to be drawn out and could be drawn out from a series of collections of letters? It hit me for a long time when, when again, in, in Jerusalem, somebody called Abraham Frank gave me his father's papers, and most of the papers consisted of lists of things. German customs asking for exact lists of all the things that would be packed into a lift, sent to Amsterdam, and from there to Haifa. Um, Reichsfluchtsteuer, the, the refuge tax that was demanded by the Nazi government, um, for which, again, People had to make exact lists of all the things they owned. Then, then came, of, of course, I, I don't know, valuable things had to be handed in. Um, then his father made a list. His, his, his father was a, was a traveling salesman for socks and underwear, I think, somewhere between Stuttgart and Ulm. Um, and he decided, if I emigrate, I'm a religious Jew. If I emigrate, it has to be Eretz Israel for me. And if I go to Eretz Israel, it cannot be Rechov ben Yehuda Straße, but it has to be a kibbutz. I know I will hate it, but this is my decision. And he took the little booklet in which he used to enter how many socks he has sold a day and how much money he has made and how much the train cost between Stuttgart and Ulm. Cow, banana. Uh, and all the things he now had to deal with uh, in the kibbutz somewhere on, on the on the Kinneret Lake, I, I, I forgot the name. So things play a really important role. Things, material objects have been researched as semaphores, is that the right name? Carriers of memory, because they represent things like pride of ownership. Um, continu family continuity. Maybe that's that's one of the points. Is that it is a symbol of the continuity of my family history, even though it doesn't take place in Heilbronn anymore, but but now in London. And how can I throw it away when it tells me some hideous as it is? <laughs> when it tells me something about about my own family, maybe that's uh, that's something. And then of course she was she was a good Schwäbische Hausfrau, as as, as we say, and and. Uh, she really kept sitting in her flat. I mean, the father left a week earlier or so, went to Amsterdam and was out of Germany when Hermine was still sitting on her things. Um, there is a certain attachment to material objects. Um, museums work a lot with that. What would I pack in my suitcase if I had to emigrate and, and illustrate the topic of emigration uh, with, with suitcases? Yeah, that's a uh, very really interesting research area. And, and yeah, what would be worth looking into more such collections? I mean, also here, the letter as material objects, it's, it's, it's really more than just a text written on it. And I agree with um, you know, a lot of what you've said, um, resonates very much with my collection as well. Um, the letter itself is material object. I think it's, I agree with you in the sense of continuity, but there's also something about the materiality of where those objects were used. I kind of, there, it's a lot about home. So a couple of fragmented thoughts. The first thought that occurred to me, Julia, when you talked about the dinner service is that I have just become the recipient of my grandmother's dinner service, which was schlepped, I've been told several times, from Waldrich in Poland, where my grandparents went after the war, having survived in, in the Soviet Union and where my mother was born. And this, this dinner service was then schlepped to Israel after they were kicked out of Poland and then schlepped all the way to South Africa because my grandmother wanted to know that it would be held safely and then schlepped all the way from South Africa here because, you know, so that it will be safe here. And do I want this dinner service? But there's something about this dinner service. It's my grandmother's dinner service, you know, and it's the Polish, it's the continuity and we will eat the chicken soup in it and we'll use it, you know, so that it, it's, it's not just continuity, there's something about its use at the dinner table in the family. And I think 
so when I think about the, the discussion of material objects in the letters, they are also, they're especially items in the home and they form the basis of these lists, equally as, as Joachim said, endless lists of all the things that we can you, you know, ask for compensation for, but that's actually an exercise of, right, we're gonna go back to grandma Johanna's um, living room and let's imagine he's got this cousin in Sao Paulo he's very close to and we're imagining all the different rooms and do you remember that New Year's Eve party that we held there and there was the mahogany sideboard and there was this beautiful table and the beautiful this so it's part of the the memory work of re-inhabiting you know the, those spaces that they lived in um, through these material objects um, so, as you say, there, there is a scholarly literature that, that talks about materiality, and it's certainly something that we can um, use the letters to, to mine more, more of. Yeah, thank you. I think there's a name for these objects, so linkage objects, which I think is quite useful to think about what links you to the past. Um, thank you for your very interesting presentation. I have a question about authorship and ethical issues. You both worked with private collections. Did you feel there was a conflict in you of imposing your own framework uh, and representing a family history? And was there ever a conflict with the family? A much longer, more elaborate answer, but I'll, I'll, I'll try and um, give some reflections. Um, I think, yes, there are, at a very basic level, there are ethical issues in the sense that this is a private correspondence, as we've said, was never intended for anybody else's eyes apart from the people that they were addressed to. And certainly in the correspondence that I looked at, there were private things. And I know that the person who stood at the center of this collection was a very private man. He talked about how he wanted to burn all the letters Though I'm not convinced because he also wrapped them really carefully in, in string. Um, but there were aspects of the letters that I decided I, I had to think through and then decided it is not necessary to talk about this because there are family members that are still alive. There are painful parts of the, you know, of relationships, of how those relationships went, of the history. And it's, it, it's not necessary. Now, the family, um, in my case, were very... Um, uh, open with me and very happy for me to, to kind of do, do whatever I needed to with the letters. Um, at the same time, I think, if I look back at that now, it, it certainly gave me a kind of freedom. They never, ever dictated or kind of expressed concern about something that I included that I shouldn't have included. And at the same time, because they were so invested in the process, it was something that was always there for me about, you know, how am I telling the story? You know, it, it was just, it, it was just there. Um, I think that's probably as much as I, I would like to say. I'm happy to have a longer private conversation with you about it, but it, it turned out to be much more complicated than I thought it was going to be when they had said, great, do whatever you like. And they meant it. <laughs> access to everything and, and obviously to tell all the stories that, that are in there. I, I mentioned the, the, the guy in Bombay and it turns out, although Liesl left him and went back to London and started her own life, he did marry in the end and uh, his two children read my story with great interest because they had never heard about the lady before. <laughs> um, but again, they were very generous, just insisted on me declaring that he acted like a gentleman, which I, which I was very happy to confirm. Uh, <laughs> you, I, I, yeah, I became part of the story. That was one moment where I thought, oh, careful, um, this could hurt other people. And this is obviously something that you, that you don't want. So there surely are strategies like anonymization or just asking people for their permission. And if they don't give it, then, then you don't use it. Um, on the other hand, I really think too much is made with this ethics um, thing. Um, as I said before, the stories want to be told. And if there's controversy afterwards, then there's controversy afterwards. That's fine. That's fun. That's, that's, that's needed. 
um, oh, these be careful and don't do something personal. And well, what kind of clinical academic work is this? This is not, not for me. But I, as I said, I was very lucky as well. I have something, if I may, yeah. and I never responded to, to, to Shirley, and, and I thought you mentioned song and, and your book on music in the Holocaust. Is, like Julia was asking about things, is music, is song a carrier of migration memory? There's this Israeli Facebook group, Hoppe Hoppe Reiter, which is of course now is a German children's song. Um, Charlie had a working title for a while. Wäre ich ein Vöglein, after wenn ich ein Vöglein wäre, flög ich zu dir, this, this, this German song. Um, are, are songs carriers of migration memory? Yes, without question. And I think they are, they are objects. I mean, they, they, are, they are also objects that inhabit the space in between, as it were. Um, they are, there are so many things that are interesting, I think, and distinctive about songs, I mean, songs, the songs that I was studying, the songs that originate in a kind of context where people are um, experiencing something or um, going through an experience as part of a larger collective um, often become a space where those kinds of collective ideas are shared because they are sung, because they can, they, the ones that survive tend to be the ones that people remember. So they become a kind of mnemonic device that is introduced, that is sung in a group, and that people remember that are collected later. Um, and we often can't trace, you know, who is the person who wrote this down or who created it, because often it's not written down. So very differently to a letter, it's not an individual creation. It's not something that's written by one person to another. It's the kinds of songs I'm interested in at least kind of originate um, and then are added to and infused with the process as it were they kind of are part of the process um, and can and can embody and, and collect those collect those things along the way I think there's I mean there's lots of fascinating work that's being done on music and migration um, over the last decade or two. Yes, um, I just wanted to follow up on this question about private things uh, and whether there's any kind of system that one could consider for regulating uh, the publication of things. I mean, one example, for example, that I'm I um, and others here will know well is that the National Archives have uh, periods uh, for, um, of tens of years uh, uh, before material will go into the into the archives to be available, and then there are other personal materials which are subject to a longer closure period, uh, and. I mean, it's frustrating when things aren't available uh, and the material is a mixture of things people in government said and things about private individuals. But I was asking myself during the discussion about the, the whole question of, of all this very as private material, as, as people have said, never intended to be available to a wider public uh, and uh, obviously the present present company very thoughtful very careful very considerate uh, but do we need to think a bit more broadly about protecting some some of this material and if so how Maybe this is an opportunity to, to amplify on what we were talking about earlier and Joachim's kind of, why do we need to be so clinical and protect all of it? And I think, I suppose my response to that would be, I think I'm inclined in the same way as you, broadly speaking, to, you know, to, to 
explore and see what we can find with the with the care and rigor that we take with all the sources we use right i mean we have to approach them um seriously and responsibly as historians not just letters anything anything that we use i think in my case the things that i i thought ought to be protected i don't know what i think about regulation but the kind of personal censorship that i placed on it as it were is when it related to painful things for existing family members about relationships about things that they that would have hurt living people in my estimation it, it felt important to me not to expose that would regulation change that i mean i shudder to think what regulation would do we would just cross out three quarters of these correspondences because who needs to know what they ate for breakfast and i don't know what isn't isn't private so i would i would definitely not be inclined um to regulate i think there's a fairly narrow set of stuff that as long as one is behaving responsibly within the parameters of you know historical work that wasn't one does with rigor that we're not such dangerous creatures <laughs> but if, when a family decides they don't want to throw things away they want to have them stored somewhere they still can put a kind of quarantine uh, of 20 years 30 years in, in in collaboration with the archive and say only in 30 years time it can be open because then everybody you know will will, will be gone that, that's always possible and it still would save the collection which which would be good and then we will close the discussion there so it just leads me to thank the, both of our speakers for their brilliant talks the uh, questions that the uh, uh, thoughts we've had and to thank uh, everyone here everyone online too and to all the like, participants that, that came earlier in the in the day um uh, to hope that something can come out of this like, uh, moving forward more so uh, thank you very much and uh, safe trip home.